Hello and welcome to today's ACM SIGSOFT webinar. This webcast is part of ACM SIGSOFT's commitment to provide value to its current and future members. The ACM SIGSOFT webinar series features speakers from the Future of Software Engineering track at the International Conference of Software Engineering, as well as select keynote speakers and distinguished paper authors. I'm Robert Dyer, Assistant Professor at Bowling Green State University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command-R on a Mac, or refresh your browser on mobile devices. Or you can close and relaunch the presentation. Control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during the, this webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click the Submit button. At the end of the presentation, we will have time to respond to questions. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. Today's presentation is Introducing the Vulnerability History Project by Andy Manili. Andy has been an assistant professor of software engineering at Rochester Institute of Technology since 2011. His research and teaching is focused on how software engineers can build secure systems and how we can learn from software project histories in both quantitative and qualitative ways. His research has resulted in many top-tier academic publications. Andy, without further ado, take it away. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I really appreciate uh, everybody coming out for this. This is, uh, this is really exciting. Um, yeah, like he said, I'm from RIT. Um, I'm an assistant professor, although actually starting in July, I'm going to be an associate professor. I just got the letter. I just got tenure. So super excited about that. Um, so yeah, um, I am a member of the uh, Department of Software Engineering, and, um, but I also do security. And so I am actually also an extended faculty member to our Department of Computing Security. I work with those folks a lot. I also do some work in, um, we have a research center devoted to cybersecurity, so the RIT Center for Cybersecurity. So this is kind of a, uh, a collaboration amongst uh, all, of, all of those people. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about vulnerabilities and security and, um, and why should we care about vulnerability history and, and what we really should be um, doing. So um, the idea here is that every mistake has a story. So um, first let me start by telling you a, a story. Um, so Google Chrome, uh, you know, one of the most popular browsers out there. It's, uh, everybody knows this. And, and as if you use any browser, you'll, you'll know that, the, that these things get patched all the time. Um, they, and, and that's actually kind of a good thing. Um, vulnerabilities are constantly being found in these things. Um, vulnerabilities are actually being um, constantly found in a lot of software today. Uh, we, and, and so um, this is something that users see all of the time. Um, and for me, as a software engineer, whenever I see um, a vulnerability being patched, I think of that as um, some sort of engineering failure, so some sort of engineering mistake happened. And so, um, what, uh, so what I like to tell is, is here's an example of a vulnerability, okay? So Google Chrome, um, I, I just went into one of my data sets and I just randomly picked a, a, a line from, the, uh, um, from, from my Excel sheet and I picked a vulnerability. So this one is not any, there's nothing really special about it. It wasn't a, a show-stopping vulnerability, but I thought I would tell the story a little bit. So it's CVE 2010-0662. And um, what happened in this vulnerability, that happened back in 2010, um, was that um, there was a, a, a developer was working in um, inter-process communication within Chrome. So Chrome has multiple browser tabs. Those tabs all talk to each other. And, um, and in the way, in the routine that parses bitmap files, so, uh, so un uncompressed image files, um, it was trusting uh, the wrong variable. And in fact, it was actually trusting um, a bitmap file that was coming in and, and the bitmap file said, you know, could define its own size and, rather, and in the metadata as opposed, to, um, as opposed to just looking at the size of the actual file. Um, in the end, the vulnerability was actually relatively small, but I'll, I'll get to that. 
Um, but what this allowed you to do is it allowed what's called an integer overflow, uh, a wraparound. So if you get to a, a high integer, it gets and it goes to the limit of an integer. It wraps around to the other side. That can lead to a memory corruption vulnerability. And what this vulnerability allowed was it allowed attackers to um, uh, access the renderer. And so this could be used for things like phishing scams and, um, and other things like that. Um, and it all had to do with one browser tab talking to another. Okay, so um, Chrome has had uh, hundreds of these vulnerabilities, uh, actually a little over a thousand of, of these vulnerabilities over the last eight years. Um, and um, so what, okay, that, if that's the vulnerability, what actually happened? Well, um, what happened with this particular vulnerability is um, it was reported anonymously. So, um, so somebody filed a bug and, um, and they explained in detail what the vulnerability was. In fact, the, 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 the description that you see is, is pretty close to what is, ended up getting reported. Um, the other members of the development team that was working on that code looked at that code and said, yep, that's definitely a vulnerability. Uh, we need to fix this. And so they, a few days later, um, ended up fixing it. The fix looks like this. Um, it is 11 lines of code. Uh, really, you know, the, this here is a, is a, is a diff. Um, this is the actual commit that fixed the vulnerability. Um, you can see here the, the, lines, the, in, the lines of code in red are um, the lines that were deleted, and the lines of code in green are the lines that they added. So if you edit a line of code, it looks like an ed, a delete and an add. So this is kind of a standard git diff. Um, you can see that, that uh, really what it came down to is uh, which variables should we trust? Should we trust the, the user um, or not trust the user? And that's kind of the, the mistake that was made. Seems, seems rather small. Seems like a, like, a, like a small kind of thing. Um, however, I would argue that um, much in the same way that developing software is not just programming, um, an a engineering mistake is also not just a programming mistake. Um, a lot of times when we look at these vulnerabilities, we kind of patch them and we move on. Um, but what, what are the deeper mistakes behind that? And what can we learn from these? Okay, so, uh, so, so this vulnerability, you can see that it was just a, a few lines of code. Um, they made some changes, um, and then that, they changed what the, what the return behavior would be, and that's it. Um, so, uh, so what happened after this is then, he, uh, then the, they created a code review. So that code review reviewed the fix for the bug, and then, they, and then they, the patch uh, landed in the system. Okay. So uh, as you can see, in, in fixing the bug, they uh, were able to give each other uh, uh, feedback on ways to fix the bug, uh, ways to, to fix the code. Um, they, had, they had some suggestions. You can kind of, this is much, this software is um, uh, Rietveld. It's actually a lot like GitHub pull requests where you can kind of comment in line. Um, okay, so that is how the vulnerability was, was found and then fixed. Kind of an uh, uninteresting thing. Um, from that point of view. My question is, and here's a slide full of lots of text, is what really happened with this vulnerability? What, what really happened? So, um, so first, this vulnerability was first introduced into the system, from what I can tell from the repository, um, it was first introduced back in 2008, and then it was fixed in, um, in uh, de December 2009. So it was in the system a little, little over a year, about you know, maybe 16 months. And, um, and the code was actually part of a reorganization effort. So initially the code was written to process bitmaps. Um, nobody was expecting to put this in a central location like inter-process communication. Um, they were just parsing bitmaps. They weren't thinking about security for that. But then they, they reorganized this part of the subsystem and they put it back out onto the, onto the uh, inter-process communication. And then, um, as you can see from my slide here, there were a couple of commits from um, several different developers, um, and and the the file did not have more than you know one or two people repeating the same stuff to the file. So that means that this file, and actually if you look at the name of the file, it's a utility file. So this is kind of one of those util files. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of the junk drawer of utility file things that nobody really, maybe nobody's taking ownership of, maybe um, nobody's really thinking about it, maybe, uh, you know, it's just they've always used this thing before and, and nobody's actually devoted effort to it. Um, it gets a commit every few months. Um, and and um, there are some people who go in and rewrite some things, but for the most part, um, this vulnerability sat in the system with people working on this code, and it was missed. Furthermore, e what's interesting is that for this vulnerability on April 24, 2009, this developer, Abart, who is a different developer than the one who introduced it, um, uh, was actually working on this, these very lines of code, and, and his commit message even says, um, 
uh, we should be thinking about the size of bitmaps coming over inter-process communication. So, so this was even thought about. Uh, this problem was even considered, um, and yet they still missed it. Um, and then most, some more people worked on it, and nobody talked about it again until it was, it was found and fixed. So there's a lot to look at here. Um, you know, what were they talking about? Were they talking about security? Were they, um, are there design issues? Were there process issues? Was there human issues where, where, where there's developer turnover? There are all kinds of questions that we can, that we can look at here. Um, so th what's the takeaway of this vulnerability? Um, was this vulnerability easy to find? I would say no. Um, Chrome is about 5 million lines of code. It is a massive system. Um, and it is, it's all in C, mostly in C. It's actually in lots of languages, but it's mostly in C. And, and um, that is like, for, according to my math, it's like finding one drop of water in one six gallon, in six one gallon buckets. Um, finding a vulnerability in this system, if you're just going to be looking at code, is extremely difficult. And, and there are automated approaches, there are fuzzers, and there's, there are bounties, and there are, there are ways that we've been developing to try and find these things. But, um, but truth be told, they are rare. And yet they can be very severe. And that's kind of the, the hardest part about vulnerabilities, is that they're rare but very severe. Um, so like I said, every vulnerability, in my view, there's, there's, there's actually not, it's you know, much in the same way that software is not just coding. Um, there are actually a lot of engineering failures that can go into a vulnerability being introduced. And, and so, uh, so that's kind of the, the, the thing that inspired me the most. When I first got into security, um, I really wanted to understand these coding mistakes. And, um, and sometimes they're not really coding mistakes. Sometimes they're design mistakes, they're process mistakes, they're architecture mistakes. Um, there are all kinds of mistakes that, that manifest themselves eventually in code. So, okay, so this is definitely, this, this stuff gets scarier and scarier the more you look at it. So what is RIT doing? Let me quickly summarize. Here's what RIT is doing um, for this, um, for these, these issues. Um, uh, first of all, we've created this Center for Cybersecurity, and we have over 20 faculty involved in the center. It's a very interdisciplinary work. Um, it's kind of spearheaded by the Department of Computing Security, but we are um, we've been hiring people um, in every in every area into this center, and we're very excited about that. And so I, I thought I would share that. Um, but we're also we also believe here at RIT that that um, security is not just something that is interesting for people who are interested in it. Um, we definitely need people who are security professionals, but we also need people who are um, – we also need people who are going to be software engineers to be aware of security. And really, I would say that security is a responsibility um, for everyone to uh, – it's, it's a responsibility for everyone. It's a reality that everybody must face. So, um, so one thing that we did that I that, that I'm that my thing is um, is I developed a course uh, six years ago when I came to RIT. Um, I developed a course called Engineering Secure Software, and that course um, is required for all SE majors. Um, and I really like that because not every per, not everybody is a security hobbyist, but everybody should be aware of these kinds of, of of vulnerabilities that can be introduced into your system. And in particular, how do you incorporate security into the software development life cycle? Because um, software engineers are, are the ones with deadlines, right? So, okay, that's what we're doing. Okay, so here, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm going to do in this, in this talk. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over a couple of studies that I've done. Um, but the, to me, the more important thing that I want to talk to you about today is my next project, um, which is the Vulnerability History Project. I'm, I'm really proud of that. Um, uh, but I, I, in order to understand why I'm doing this, this Vulnerability History Project, um, I want to show you some of the empirical studies that I've done and, uh, and just kind of explain why, why the history project needs to exist. Uh, I'm going to cover a couple of papers, but I'm going to cover them really quickly. Um, so uh, I'll bet you have questions about them. Feel free to, you know, feel free to ask in the Q&A thing. Um, uh, but yeah, so I'm going to talk about primarily um, a bugs and vulnerabilities paper uh, that we did at MSR two years ago and, um, and then uh, it won an ACM Distinguished Paper, Best Paper. Uh, we did a journal follow-up with it. We're following up with it in other ways. Um, that's kind of one thread that I like to talk about. And another one about bounties and severity, and, but then I just have a bunch of other studies that I just want to make sure you're aware of. Um, so yeah, let me get into that first. So bugs and vulnerabilities. So uh, a bug... Um, a lot of times when you think of a bug in software, you might have some, think of something like this ladybug, right? Um, but the truth is that vulnerability – to say that, that a vulnerability is a bug is a little bit like saying that Shelob from Lord of the Rings is also a bug. I mean, I guess technically, but 
it's a very different beast, right? Um, vulnerabilities are, are hidden features for attackers. They are unintended functionality. They are um, the system should not do what it's not supposed to do. They are, um, they, they, they are uh, uh, well, they are bugs, but they violate the security of the system. Um, they are something that needs to be defended against. So while, while by our definition of a vulnerability is that it is an instance of a bug, um, I, would, I would say that, that uh, in my experience, they are conceptually different. Um, and so our question in this study is, are they empirically different? And, and the reason that I, I did this is um, there is a ton of software engineering research on um, bug prediction. And so uh, we, we know that bugs are predictable. And so uh, we've been developing all kinds of models and metrics and methods to uh, predict where bugs are going to be. Does that translate to vulnerabilities? And in my experience, um, those bug prediction models don't directly translate. Um, they, they haven't been in, in my, whenever I've tried to reproduce it and apply it to vulnerabilities specifically, um, it usually doesn't work. So, uh, so we set out to kind of look at this a couple of different ways, and we did a, a case study of Chrome, and we actually did a, later a case study in Apache, and we found that, um, and we asked the, the basic question, are vulnerabilities and bugs in the same files? Which is to say, if you, had a, if you had the world's perfect bug prediction model, would it also be a good vulnerability prediction model? And we found that the answer is really no. I mean, there is a statistically significant correlation between bugs and vulnerabilities, but it, it kind of ends there. The, the Cohen's D overlap is a very high overlap, it's considered a weak correlation. Um, but this next slide actually kind of tells the whole story for me. Um, this one was most convincing for me. So here I have a ranking of um, files, and, and say the, the blue line is, say we had the world's perfect um, vulnerability prediction model. Um, so this is assume that we're at the time of release. Um, for in this case, uh, release 35. We have various other releases in the paper. Um, release 35. And... Um, and then suppose we just randomly ordered our files. That would be the, the red line. Um, the, the actual line, the gray line, is if we, ranked by, um, if we ranked our files by the number of bugs. So say we had the world's most perfect um, bug prediction model, how well would we be at finding vulnerabilities? And as you can see, like, yeah, we're beating random, um, but not very well. Uh, we're barely beating random. And so... Uh, the, the answer that we come to from that is um, we, we need different uh, vulnerability prediction models. And um, I'm, I'm, you know, there, there actually are plenty of vulnerability prediction models out there. They're not nearly as good as bug prediction models because vulnerabilities are much more rare. We don't have as much data. That's the, the, the data part is something that I want to take on. Um, but, but yeah, we, we need other models. And, and so other researchers have already picked up on this, and they've been de uh, developing vulnerability prediction models. But, um, but, but this, is, this is something that, we've been, um, that we want to look at. But that being said, there are vulnerability prediction models, but we just need to build different models. Like, they're, they are conceptually different, and they are empirically different. Okay, so that is, that is the first study that I like to talk about as, a, as just an example of something that you can do with vulnerability history data, is you can see how well it correlates with something that is conceptually similar um, from there and tell us what we can do about uh, bug prediction models. Another study that we did that I'm really proud of is um, severity. So, um, so every vulnerability that gets reported um, has a severity measure. I mean, we, you know, it's important that we measure severity, right, so that we can prioritize, so that we can understand. Um, researchers really need this severity measure. They need some measure of severity so that they can look at, you know, can, they, can we predict really bad vulnerabilities or, or something like that. Um, and so the de facto standard is the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, and it is required by the National Vulnerability Database, the NVD. And... Um, and I, I, I don't mean to be too critical, but I am not a fan of the CVSS. Um, I teach it in my class, in my engineering secure software class, and it is the material that the students get wrong all the time because it is very subjective and very broad, and we spend an entire week teaching it to college students um, who are very smart, um, but they are, um, but they, but the, the, the system is just very subjective. Um, and, and a part of it is that the CVSS boils it down to just a few questions. Um, and the questions are, diff are, are, are difficult to answer. So, uh, so we wanted to look at the CVSS, and we wanted to see see what we see uh, uh, how that stacked up to what we consider another measure of severity, which is money. 
um, how much money was the company willing to pay to get this vulnerability? And if you look at the, the criteria, and we did in this study, I'll show some to you, um, what, are the, uh, what are the criteria for awarding bounties for these vulnerabilities? And, um, and if you look at the criteria, those criteria fit the definition of severity um, quite well. It's just that those questions tend to be more specific and answerable. So we were wondering how often does CVSS align with bounties? If a company is willing to pay lots of money for that vulnerability to not be on the black market and to be reported, um, then, uh, then it should also be a severe vulnerability, right? Well, let's take a look. So, um, so uh, what we did is we looked at about $2.1 million worth of bounties, so a lot of bounty, bounties, 700 vulnerabilities, 24 different products. The, the main products that we were looking at were Android, Chromium, and Flash, although we looked at a number of different products. Um, uh, this is a, a workshop paper that we did at FSC this, this past year, um, so you can take a look at it there. Here is, here is the, the disconnect. Um, unfortunately, bounties and CVSS scores are just not really correlated. Um, the Spearman's row is 0.3, which means that you're accounting for like 9% of the variance. It's, it's maybe technically statistically significant, but it's very weak, um, and, which is funny because you would expect the two of them to be correlated. Um, and, and so that, that is really surprising to me, um, especially when you start looking at, at um, on the right-hand side, you can see that there are a lot of CVSS 10, which is the most severe kind of vulnerability um, and there are lots of them that didn't even go for any money. Um, even if you remove the zeros um, and, and just do a little bit and just the ones that were 50 bucks, there were CVSS 10s that were worth 50 bucks and there were CVSS 10s worth 60,000. Um, there's just not a correlation. Um, we did this per project. We looked at this many different ways. We looked at subparts of the uh, CVSS. In fact, here are some results on that. Um, and we found that there are questions within the, the, the CVSS base, the one that's required, the one that everybody uses, it's really only six questions. And there, there is, you can see that, that for example, access vector um, is, you know, higher for, um, there is a clear difference between, between local and network. Um, so that's interesting. Um, or, or authentication, none and single, there is a clear difference. And, and I would say that those are actually good questions. They're actually pretty uh, objective. But the other ones like access complexity, and the question is literally something like, um, uh, you know, how complex is this vulnerability to access, um, you know, none, low, high, or something like that. And, you know, it's just very, um, it's, it's, they, they have defined steps in their spec, but, but people don't know the spec, and, and, and even if you know the steps in the spec, it's, it's very difficult to follow. So, um, so, there, so you can see some of the subjectivity right there in, in those box plots. So anyway, um, uh, so the, the, the disconnect here is that um, what is the difference between CVSS and bounties? And so what we did is we did a qualitative uh, analysis of, um, of various products, of 24 products, 15 bounty programs. And, and here's what those results look like. Um, so a, uh, when it comes to – what we did is we went through every um, bounty criteria. So what they do is when they create a – um, vulnerability bounty program when Google does or uh, there's, a, there's a company called Hacker One that kind of brokers these. Uh, a bunch of uh, projects will have their own um, bounty criteria and they'll say things like, well, if you are able to send the exploit remotely, we will give you an extra $500 or we will give you an extra $1,000 if you're able to bypass our cross-site scripting filter or something like that. Um, and so we did. We looked at all those criteria, and then we coded them. Um, we coded them individually, and then we did a CAPA statistic between um, the two researchers. Um, and then we looked at um, how often does this criterion is it ex is it explicitly mentioned in the CVSS? And as you can see, there are some things that are mentioned in both bounties and CVSS. That's the top row there. Um, and and in in CVSS, we have kind of three levels of that. You can actually it can be on their website and their calculator, which is the thing that most people look at, or you could actually look at um, uh, uh, their full specification. And most people aren't going to go and read that um, when they enter this vulnerability data, um, severity data, but um, if, in case you do, it's there. But even then, that's the base. That's not everything. The full is where, where there's, there's more criteria that are optional that people historically don't really use. Um, again, there's a little bit more there, but um, the vast majority uh, are – 
of the bounty criteria that people are saying we will pay you more money if you give us a really bad vulnerability and we define really bad vulnerability as you know uh code execution for example um it's then then um that just doesn't code execution is not explicitly mentioned in CVSS um, and so we wonder if this, if this, if these results could be used to make better severity scoring, and that's actually what we're working on next. Um, is um, you know, for example, does this vulnerability lead to code execution? Um, and you know, yes or no, or, or something like that. Um, that is a much easier thing. Or does this violate a sandbox? Or does this violate for web? You know, does this violate a same origin policy? That is that is a very clear thing. It's a little bit technology specific, yes, but. Um, um, those questions might be better. So anyway, um, you know, when money is at stake, people get a little bit more specific. So I think that uh, I think that the CVSS could learn a lot from uh, from bounty programs. So um, are bounties themselves a good measure of se of se severity? Well, that's something that we want to look into. This is actually something that we're you know submitting grants for these days. Um, and so if you're interested in this, you know, let me know. Um, so I think I think that bounties can be a good measure of severity. Um, you know, I think that, or at least I think that, that we can learn a lot from bounty programs. Um, these, these have become much more popular lately. Um, there is a lot of game theory in terms of how does this interact with the vulnerability market? How does this interact with the black market? There is a market for vulnerabilities. Um, there have been plenty of studies on, on those markets, and, and I think that we could learn a lot from them. Um, but I think that we can improve our scoring systems um, by doing this. And so if anybody here is, is from NIST or from the first organization, um, I, I, you know, I would love to, to help, uh, help improve the CVSS. Um, it's definitely necessary, um, but uh, I, I, think, I, think my, I think our study, our small study, um, is already um, eroding its, its credibility. So, okay, so those are two studies, all right? Um, you know, I, I didn't want to spend the entire talk here talking about my research, but I, I wanted to show you, in case you haven't seen empirical software engineering research on security, those are two studies that we've done. Um, here are a few more studies that we've done um, that I'll just kind of briefly mention here. Um, so we, we've been looking at attack surface metrics, so how do you use the call graph of a system to predict where the vulnerabilities are going to be? Um, developer experience. We've looked at um, how a developer, uh, the, when, a, when a developer commits a fix to a vulnerability, or if they commented on the fix to a vulnerability, the code they work on after that um, is less likely to have a vulnerability themselves. And the idea here is that there's there's training, there's knowledge transfer. Um, I have to say that the first time I saw a vulnerability in code that I wrote that I thought was good code um, was a transformative experience for me. Um, I see that as a transformative experience for my students too, um, and, and I think that it is for developers in practice. And so maybe we can measure that and and use that as a way to to say, you know what, this code has been worked on by a lot of people who have never had to fix a vulnerability before. Maybe we're going to have um, maybe we're going to have some problems here. So um, that's just a um, an idea. Now my last one, I'm really proud of this one. This one's been a really fun um, uh, project that we've actually just got it started with a, a, an interdisciplinary project with um, some English professors here and some other, a psychology professor and a public policy professor. Um, this is uh, security conversations. And so how do we apply natural language techniques to code review discussions? And what are the linguistic characteristics of a security discussion? And can we identify those characteristics and identify the absence of those characteristics so that we can say, hmm, maybe we're more likely to have a vulnerability because nobody's been talking about security or nobody's been given quality feedback. Um, and if we can identify linguistic characteristics of that. So for example, um, uncertainty. There are a lot of really good classifiers um, for when people talk about uncertainty. And um, is there, uh, can we identify that? So um, that's, that's a, another study that we've been working on. So you can see that my life, my research, is all about cranking out these, these interesting case studies and understanding the history of vulnerabilities. And there's, there's one linchpin to all of this, and that is the vulnerability data. Um, uh, we can do so much with this vulnerability data. You can see that there are human factors to look at. There are product factors to look at. Um, I've been studying vulnerability history data for now 11 years, basically most of graduate school and, and now uh, my time as an assistant professor, and um, and it's a very unique kind of data set. It's very difficult to collect. Um, it's a lot of work to collect, 
Uh, I get asked all the time, can I, hey, can I have your data? And I try to share it as often as, as I can. Um, but the problem is that a lot of times when I share that data, uh, it is specific to what I was, um, it was specific to what I was uh, uh, answering, to the research questions that I was answering. And so what I want to do is I want to make sure that everybody learns from our mistakes. So um, I think that students find this material really useful. In fact, the course that I mentioned at the, at the, earlier in, the, in this talk, uh, Engineering Secure Software, um, most of that material I actually don't get from textbooks. I have, I, we, uh, the, the textbooks that we have are only okay. Uh, most of the material that I get is actually from what I've learned directly from my research, from, from actual vulnerabilities that have actually happened. Um, and, and, so, and, there, and, and so that's, so I think students can learn from this. And so I've actually started shifting the course more to be more research oriented where students are themselves are reading vulnerabilities, uh, real ones. And then we're not just talking about something that's theoretical, we're talking about something that's historical. And, and history is messy and, and complicated and takes a little while to learn, and, um, but I think that's, that's worth doing. Research, so students, at least RIT students, are already benefiting from vulnerability history data, and that's really good. Um, researchers, they're already benefiting from vulnerability history data, um, not as well as, I, as I'd like. I'd like to disseminate this data more, um, but, and I'd like to collaborate and curate this data, but um, they already are benefiting. But there is a, a group that is not benefiting from this, and that, and that is practitioners. Um, I hate to say it, but um, it's really unfortunate that, that uh, the industry doesn't always pay attention to what we're doing. Um, I mean, maybe if you're in industry and you're, you're, what, you're listening to this webinar, then, then, um, then you are, and that's great, and, th and thank you so much for, for your time. But, uh, but by and large, um, there is a lot that developers today can learn about security, um, and I think a good way to teach them is through history, is through actual problems that have actually happened. And we look at them not just as coding problems, but we look at them as engineering problems. So what we need is um, if the world needs case studies, and I mean academic case studies, I mean um, student case studies, I mean practitioner case studies, you know, um, in whatever form we want, at whatever level of rigor we want, um, if we're going to need that, we're going to need data. And, um, and I have data. I have lots of data. I've been using it. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share it. It's not in the best state because it, it was really specific to what I was um, answering for the, for the study that I was doing. And so a lot of people are recollecting this data. And honestly, it's like 90% of the work is, is uh, collecting this vulnerability data and making sure that it's correct. And actually, most studies that, that um, don't put a lot of work into collecting their vulnerability data and making sure that it's actually correct, is not, most of those studies are studies that I don't really trust. Um, so, for example, if you're if you're just going to be downloading vulnerability data from the CVE, from the National Vulnerability Database, that's a that's a, a largely uncurated um, database. There is some fact checking that's done, but a lot of times um, things get double reported. Um, we had a problem with uh, the Chrome data where there was a, a person, one person in Russia, who was um, reporting fake CVE entries um, just to make himself look. Like uh, you know, saying that he found all these CVEs and he would create an actual entry in the CVE, and Google and we we reached out to Google and Google said we none of those those, those make no sense. That's that's just made up. Um, you know, if people just download straight from the CVE, unfortunately, you're going to run into um, some of those problems. Um, so we need to we need to curate that, and and we we're not going to be able to do all of them. But if we focus on a couple of case studies, um, then we will be able to get some good clean data out of that. Um, there are other database projects. There's actually lots of security database projects out there. I mean, the CWE and KPEC are fantastic um, taxonomies, and they're, they're chock full of, of really good information. They can be a little, a little overwhelming to students sometimes. Um, they do trace to some history, but I think that we could do better. Um, and, and if we focus on um, what I really like about the CWE is how much it focuses on software engineering. It gives you mitigations for um, architecture, for design, for implementation, things like that. So um, I think that we can, we, you know, I, I, I feel like this is a more of a historical bent of, of the CWE um, using data from the CVE and data that is from the software development artifacts. So that's what this is. So the, this is what I've been working on for the last year, and um, we're going to be launching the website about a year from now. So we're still, we're still working on it, although I'm trying to um, get support and get, get people interested and get the word out now. Um, the Vulnerability History Project, it is all about data for researchers, assignments for students, and lessons for practitioners. So it is all about curating good vulnerability data. 
Um, so the idea of curating is that we correct things that we see are wrong. So sometimes a developer will say, you know, oh, this vulnerability was fixed by this commit, and sometimes they'll get that wrong. You know, they'll type it, they'll type in the wrong thing or, or something. Um, it's the kind of thing where, where it's really tedious for one poor graduate student to do, but it's much easier to, uh, to crowdsource that. So, um, uh, so, so that's what it's about. It's about getting good, clean data. It's having data that's versioned so that when we have a study um, that gets published in, you know, ICSI, we can cite it as uh, this is version 2, this is VHP version 2.3 for the Chromium case study. Um, and, and that way, if in 2.4 we find lots of data problems, we can go back and repeat that study and, and, and you know, begin to really advance science and not just to have these papers that report once and then, um, and, and then, and then that's it. Um, but also students can really learn from this. Um, uh, so uh, I've started doing this where I've put my, have my students actually looking up and curating this data. And believe it or not, it, you know, it's tedious for, a, for a, someone like me. When I was a grad student, I did this. Um, but it was, and I learned a lot from it. Um, but actually undergrads can, can do this too. And just doing two or three vulnerabilities, you learn an, a, an enormous amount. Um, and so even though it takes them longer to do it because they're new to it, um, they really learn a lot from it. Um, and, and they also get to apply, they get to look at a real project like Chrome or Apache or, you know, something that has thousands of developers. Um, they really get to learn a lot from that. And I think they, there's a legitimacy to it um, that they really like, as opposed to being in a classroom and saying, here's what you should do and not really giving a reason. And then finally, the lessons for practitioners. I think that we can build a website, and this is what we're working on, is building a website to present um, vulnerability history data visually in a very pleasing and interesting kind of way so that people can learn very important security lessons and then have evidence to back that up and they could look at, uh, they could learn from the mistakes of others. Um, not from a standpoint of like blaming individual developers, but more about um, understanding how, how a vulnerability can be introduced, not found, fixed, refixed, all that stuff. Um, so what kind of data do we want to collect for vulnerability history? Well, uh, here's just a bunch of things off the top of my head that we've been collecting that we already have um, that we're putting into this project. Um, fixed commits and, and vulnerability contributing commits. Those are the two most important pieces of data. Um, so going, just going from a vulnerability, mapping it to the source code, um, that tracing right there is, is actually very tedious and difficult to maintain. Um, and, and so we would like the VHP to, to focus on that, to... Um, to, to uh, maintain that for, for the whole community. Um, and, and just getting the fixed commit, you can get so much. You can get who, you know, not just who fixed it, but what the actual code was that fixed it and things like that. We also look at the vulnerability contributing commits. That's what we call, um, there's, a, there's an algorithm that came out of the mining software repositories community called the SDZ algorithm. And it is a way of identifying how a vulnerability uh, or not, sorry, not just vulnerability, it's for all bugs. How do you identify um, the commit that probably introduced um, bad behavior? And um, it's not a perfect algorithm, but it's one that is done statically, and it has been shown to be, uh, to be quite good, and it's used a lot in the academic community. So I think that if we can look at how a vulnerability was introduced, and then, and then you know, what happened, how was it missed for one year, two years, three years, however long it was in the system, um, we can learn a lot. But then there's just tons of other data that we can look at. I mean, remember, every vulnerability has a story. So, you know, there are bugs and code, code review discussions. There's IRC. There's, um, you know, there's fuzz testers that are running. There's um, lessons like, you know, defense in depth. There's, there's, uh, there's code ownership churn, um, bounties and severity. There's just lots of stuff that we can collect so you can understand um, that a vulnerability was not necessarily – um, just one little mistake that a developer made on a Friday afternoon, it was actually part of a, it was missed because of many of these other issues. So the way our data curation process has been working, I've been piloting this project for about a year now, um, kind of internally without officially releasing just yet. Um, so we introduced a project into this uh, engineering secure software course. Uh, again, this course is required for our undergrads. We graduate, RIT graduates about 75 um, S software engineering undergrads a year. And um, so we get about 70 some, um, 70 or 80 some students. So th I think right now we're at three sections. Next year we might be go up to four sections a year um, on this course. And so that's a lot of students. And so what we do is we give them each two vulnerabilities. And these are vulnerabilities that I have collected a little bit of data on, um, but not a lot of data on. And um, 
And, uh, and so I want them to correct the data that we've automatically collected, but I also want them to fill out um, a bunch of structured parts and then some unstructured parts. So they, will, they tag whether or not it was found by a fuzzer. They, found, they tag whether or not there were unit tests for this code. Uh, they tag whether or not, um, you know, th things that they've learned about, things that they know from their major, um, and they get to actually see was this being done in real life. And, um, and so they look at, at uh, they, they come up with the VCC and, and things like that. So they even learn a little bit of mining software repository methodologies as part of this project. Really cool. Um, and then what they do is they do a pull request, and they do a pull request on the data. And so we keep all of our data in Git repositories on GitHub. Um, mine is, is Chromium vulnerabilities and, um, for Chrome. And, and so what they do is they, they the, they're, their submission gets run through an automated integrity checker to make sure that they've got the right syntax and everything, that they've answered the questions. Um, so in places where I just need a yes or no, um, you know, they can't put anything else, things like that, they have to correct that. Gets them to work with continuous integration, which is another good thing, another side benefit. Um, and then they, they, um, they comment on each other's pull requests. So, so having students review each other's uh, research is really important, right, because research needs to be peer-reviewed. Um, the vulnerabilities that I assign them, the two vulnerabilities, are, are, are literally random, randomized from the vulnerabilities. So, you know, uh, Chrome has a thousand vulnerabilities. Um, we're not going to be able to reach all of them through this course. We're going to get through, you know, maybe 100 a year. But if we do a random sampling, um, then that sampling can be representative of the entire project. And, um, and so, so, that's, so that's why we do a random sampling, so that we at least um, we can still achieve statistical significance um, for uh, – for various studies and so. Um, and then um, students are graded on the quality of feedback they provide and then they are graded on the quality of the response to the feedback that they have. So, that's a, so, so that we are, we're kind of grading many aspects of this. Um, so that's working out really well. And then we have this case study shepherd and right now the only shepherd is me, um, but eventually I'm gonna be looking for people to shepherd their own case studies and these are people who are really familiar with one um, open source project. So I, I know the I know Google Chrome really well. I know the the from a empirical software engineering standpoint, um, I know it really well. I also know Apache really well. Um, I don't know Firefox really well, um, but some of my colleagues do, and um, and so some of my collaborators, I'm going to ask them to to be a shepherd. And what that means is that they accept the pull request, they review and accept any change to the data that comes in. Um, and that means that, that whenever our students come across these issues, the, then the, the shepherd would approve them. And um, my ultimate goal is that if I can get funding for this, um, that, that shepherds would actually be compensated for, for their work in curating this data. But, but they, instead of having to recollect you know, five case, you know, data from five case studies for every single empirical study. They just have to manage one case study, and um, and then I manage the shepherds. Um, so that's kind of the structure that I want to do. So um, so we the way we structure our data is really all about um, reconstructing a timeline, and and so it's all about how were these vulnerabilities missed, how were these um, how were they fixed, how were they refixed, how do we prevent them for the future. Um, uh, this is an, this is kind of our our example timeline. It ain't perfect. This is what you know. This is under development right now. We're using D3 um, for visualizations, and this is a, a basic timeline that we've been putting together. But we actually have lots more data to to visualize. Um, but this is kind of what we're what we're working on right now. Um, so this our web application pulls from GitHub, um, and so so every time the you have a new release of data, it's going to um, release. Um, this is what the YAML looks like, the, what the students uh, report. So you can see that there are kind of written portions that will be presented on the website, of course, with the students' permission. Um, and, uh, uh, and, but then there are also things like tags, like this code true and file true. And, um, so you can see that, that the students are, are – the data they, that they submit is, is structured um, so that it's easy to transfer from messy student data to uh, usable research data. Um, one thing that I really want VHP to focus on is the idea of um, is the idea of case studies, and 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 that that I've even had so I've had reviewers um, say don't use the word case study. You just downloaded a bunch of a bunch of stuff and you just mined the data. You're just doing data mining. It's not it's, you're not doing a case study because you really need to get familiar with the project before calling it a case study and and um, you know, there is a discussion in the empirical software engineering community about, you know, how do we how do we conclude? Can we do can we conclude 
if you collect data from 100 different projects and you just treat them all one size fits all, um, can you really conclude based on that? Well, I guess 100 is, that seems like a lot to conclude from. Um, or can you dig deeper into a, an individual case study and really understand their process and their people and what they're doing, and then you'll collect the data a little bit differently for that case study, and then if we have enough of those case studies, um, we'll, we'll be able to generalize. And, and I, I tend to think that uh, my stance on this is, is I prefer T-shaped, depth and breadth. And so reviewers have accused, you know, so sometimes reviewers will accuse me of saying, you didn't go deep into case studies to call this a case study. And then other times reviewers say, well, you only studied one project. Um, and so uh, if I tried to do depth. And so what I'd like to do is I, I like to do both. I like to, to um, get people to collaborate on shepherding one case study deeply. And then we'll get the data, understand the data from that case study, then we maintain it. Um, and then we move on to others. And so the way that I'll scale, um, unlike the CVE, which is like managing, you know, hundreds of projects at once, and they're just kind of the, a dumping ground for lots of vulnerabilities, we want to really curate our case studies. So right now we only have two, Chromium and Apache, and we're going to scale to, uh, in the next three or four years, we'd like to scale to a few more. But we'd like to scale slowly and, and make sure that we have a shepherd who um, can put in the time to shepherding just that one case study. So, um, so that's the idea. Um, the other thing is that we have, you know, because every case study is different, um, the way that we model this data is actually a mixture of both relational and non-relational um, data. So we use both documented oriented storage and a skeleton schema so that we, ca we can do a one-size-fits-all analysis for things that fit all of the projects, but then we can also do specific things. So for example, ca uh, code review data, um, Apache doesn't have code review, or at least they do, but it's in mailing lists, um, whereas Chrome does have kind of a formal code review process. Um, you know, we don't create two separate databases for them. We use um, internal document-oriented storage to, to, uh, to handle that. Um, you know, that's kind of details on how we're accomplishing this, but um, um, that, that's kind of the idea. Um, so that's that's pretty much what I've got going. This is that, that that's what the vulnerability history project is all about. Um, I I've I've bought the domain. Um, there's just a landing page there, vulnerabilityhistory.org. Um, if you go there, there's a mailing list that you can sign up for. I would love if you're interested and you want to hear about this. I really don't send out a lot to that mailing list. It's just a, a, a every couple of months I'll send out a newsletter of what we're doing. Um, and but it, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be vulnerabilityhistory.org. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to launch it about a year from now. So I'm hoping a year from now is, is uh, when you get to look at the pretty website and when we're going to start scaling our, um, our shepherds. Um, so it's going really well. Um, if you want to get involved, there are lots of ways to get involved. Um, so if you teach security um, or if you want to teach security and you've never done it before, um, this, is a great, this is a great assignment. And you can just pick up our assignment. I've even phrased the assignment in such a way that um, – that uh, you could use it at, in, at other universities. And, um, and I can work with you about making an assignment that makes sense for you as well. Um, and, then, and then that would be, you'd be contributing right now, it would be to Chrome, um, and that would be as useful as anything else. Um, the students would, you know, would have to know a little bit of C, but you know, that's okay. Um, um, if you're a researcher, stay tuned. Um, I'm gonna have some really good data for you. Uh, uh, already, if you just go to that Chromium Vulnerabilities Repository, you can get the raw data. Um, feel free to use it. Um, feel free to cite it. Um, uh, but uh, I'm going to have some more guidelines on how to cite it. Um, if you have vulnerability data, I would love it if you become a shepherd. Just come to me. Um, yeah, so, um, so that's, what, that's what I'm working on. That's the Vulnerability History Project. I'm really excited. Um, I, it's all about data, and I, I want RIT to be known as um, the place that has really good vulnerability data so that we can um, learn from our mistakes. Um, so that is... Um, that is what I have for, uh, for this talk. I would love to, uh, to hear your questions. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, our first question is actually asking uh, if you personally have encountered any vulnerabilities for which the fix itself that was accepted either did not solve the problem, the underlying vulnerability, or it actually introduced new ones. Oh, yes, yes. God, yes, and we need more studies on this. Um, so, okay, so, so when I, uh, um, uh, so, so vulnerabilities, in my experience, is, uh, have a very high regression rate. 
um, and there are a lot of reasons for this, but I, we need a study on this, honestly. Um, and this is actually, you, if, if this project really gets off the ground, then, then we will be able to do this kind of study and, and you know, tag them as a regression. Um, but uh, so, so what I've seen um, on the ground is, is yeah, uh, a vulnerability will be fixed. It will be kind of rushed. Um, the fix, the initial fix will be just kind of like wrapping an if statement around um, a ba some bad code or something. And then a couple of months later, they'll say, oh, here's another vulnerability related to this. We were able to get around that if statement through this other thing. So, yeah, it definitely happens. Um, I would love to be able to say that, re that vulner empirically, scientifically, that, that vulnerabilities have a higher regression rate than bugs. But right now, my, my, um, my unscientific opinion is that, yeah, um, it, it does happen. All right, so we've had a, a couple of questions, and, and they're kind of asking similar things here. Uh, people are, are wondering, you know, when we talk about measuring severity, uh, should perhaps, you know, the number of copies of the artifact actually being used in the wild in fact that measure? Right, so if something is cheap and if it's ubiquitous, it's used a lot, even if the severity itself seems trivial, the fact that it's so prevalent should affect the severity rating or not. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, I agree. Um, and so CVSS does take this into account, but it's optional. Um, so nobody does it. I mean, if you, I, I, as a researcher, I can't use any of the optional parts of the CVSS because it's just not um, – it's optional, so nobody does it. Um, so there is a there is a, a, a question for is there an exploit available? Is the exploit widely disseminated? Is the exploit um, is it just proof of concept? Um, and so that is considered a temporal property of CVSS. Um, one of my one of my hopes though is that uh, see one of the things that I dislike about the way we think about severity is it lacks temporal properties. Um, and you can see right there, CVSS tried, but it, it, they made it optional. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a vulnerability can be really severe today and not severe tomorrow because everybody's patched it. And ha has the patch been widely available? Um, that was the issue with stage fright, right, is that um, the fix was actually not particularly hard, but then the, 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 the rollout of that fix was a disaster and a lot of people um, were vulnerable. Um, so... I wish that, CV, that severity in general um, was reported less like a one-time thing and more like hurricanes. So like a hurricane or like a disease in the news, they talk about it like, okay, well, right now it's this, and, and then it's going to be that, and, and, and if it hits landfall, it could get up to this severity. Um, but, you know, you know, it's a temporal thing. And, um, you know, we don't think of a hurricane as being – one particular severity, maybe just as a, a, simplif a simplification, but not. Um, but, but unfortunately, with vulnerabilities, we do think of them as being one um, severity all the time. And in fact, our uh, our a lot of research that uses severity measures thinks of them non-temporally. So, so yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. All right. So, why should bounties be correlated to severity, uh, specifically? Uh, what the person's wondering is, shouldn't they be more correlated with the risk to the actual organization? Well, those are interrelated, right? Um, uh, you know, the the so a vulnerability. So if a vulnerability is severe, it is a risk to the organization. Um, they they are. Um, I, I'm not saying that they're going to be that. I was expecting a perfect correlation between the two. Um, they are. You know, they are different measures. Um, but at the same time. Um, a severity is is uh, severity is about capturing the context of a vulnerability. Is it you know is it, it you know okay maybe you have an integer overflow. Is integer overflow good or bad? Well, it depends on where it is, right? An integer overflow could be nothing, um, depending on where it is in the product um, and how it and but it, but uh, something like a CVSS is supposed to capture that context. Um, and so so for example you know an integer overflow could be really bad. If it's if it if it's related to memory allocation and and that memory allocation leads to code execution on a on a product that has high visibility, CVSS is actually trying to capture all of that, um, and 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 I don't think it does. Um, so I definitely think that they're related. Um, I was expecting I was expecting a correlation to be um, much closer to like what we consider a strong correlation, so like a 0.7 or more. I wasn't expecting a 0.9, um, but, uh, but something that, that is better than a 
than a 0.3, um, we, we, I would definitely expect. All right. So uh, in your research, you've seen a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, somebody was wondering, have you seen any where perhaps the, the CVSS score was high or the severity was marked high, but the bounty was actually very low, and then once that was exploited, it actually led to a high financial loss for the organization? Okay. Um, <clears throat> no, no, I wasn't looking for specifically that situation. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. And if that did happen, that would be the kind of thing that I would want to be on, on as part of this project. I would hope that this project finds these, those kinds of stories. Um, so uh, in general, um, the way CVSS tends to work, it kind of is the boy who cried wolf sometimes. Um, it's often the way that it's structured is like if you can think of any reason to go up, up a tick, then, then do it. Um, it's kind of the way that it's structured. So, um, but then again, there are situations where, where there were low CVSS ones and then there was a high bounty. Um, and sometimes that has to do with the low CVSS high, going to a high bounty is um, – those are ones where I think the, 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 they didn't realize that the product – was um, that the product that, that the that the that the scope could have changed that they that they could have gone to a few other that, that it could have gone to other things. I'm trying to remember of an exact example. I can't think of an exact example, but um, that is exactly the kind of story that I would that I would love to to, to tell as a part of this project and, and discover that. Okay, so we had had a, a very interesting question here uh, regarding essentially how we can take you, what you are doing in terms of research and make it a little more accessible to the practitioners and, and to people in industry. Uh, and you did have one slide where you basically listed you know, lessons for practitioners, um, but maybe you could just expand on that a little bit. Yes, okay. So um, thank you for asking that question. I, 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 we, need, we need to be asking that question a lot in software engineering research a lot more than we are. So um, I'll tell you that I have some plans um, in my – so, for example, in my natural language processing um, project right now where we're analyzing code reviews in Google Chrome, one thing that we can do, and it wouldn't even require any buy-in from Google, is we would – if we can get our, our models good enough and our prediction models good enough um, and our feedback good enough, um, we can actually create a bot that goes into – um, Chrome and, and analyzes the data offline, which we we're already doing, um, and then finds places where we think vulnerabilities are going to be, go and, um, and say, hey, just so you know, our forecasting model says there might be some problems here. You guys should talk about security. And then if we're able to do that, um, and then you, know, you click a button saying, yeah, we were able to find some security problems, thanks. Um, if we can get that, that would be great to report back to the, to the um, to the community. That's one really easy way that we could do this. And so we're actually working toward that. Um, we're building up our natural language models um, to be of high quality. We definitely don't want to spam people. We want people to actually, you know, make their systems better. Um, that's one way that we can help. Um, the, the bug prediction and vulnerability prediction community um, don't put their money where their mouth is enough. Um, they need to be 538. Um, they need to be the people who actually put their predictions out there um, participate in the community, um, defend their decisions, um, and and a lot of times they defend their decisions to other academics. But they don't always defend it to um, to to practitioners um, who are usually smarter than they are. Um, so uh, so yeah, that's one way. Um, the lessons learned for practitioners. I think for the vulnerability history project, what I like to do is is um, I'd like to well I'd like to be the 538 for uh for vulnerability d history. So that means that when you go to the website you'll see um uh, uh stories of of vulnerabilities and engineering failures and you'll read about um a particular lesson like defense in depth or um or principle of least privilege um or or some of the other more specific principles that we talk about um and then you'll see actual smaller stories related to that and um and, and we would curate that and present that in a in a interesting way, so that a developer on his lunch break can um, you know see some interesting visualizations about um, what software development looks like, kind of at scale. Um, and that would be not just useful for Chrome developers; it would be useful for a lot of developers, even if you're not building a browser, to understand 
you know, I don't know, some sort of statistic like, well, actually one statistic from my dissertation was um, files changed by five developers or more are 16 times more likely to have a vulnerability. Um, if you have a lot of people hammering on code, you're gonna uh, then you're you're gonna have a higher likelihood of vulnerabilities, and to have that kind of thing be um, more well known in the in the in industry, um, I think would, I would I would call that a big win. All right, thank you very much, Andy. I'm afraid we've run out of time today. Thanks again to Andy for his informative presentation and insightful answers to the many questions. Special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate in today's webinar. This webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at www.sigsoft.org slash resources slash webinars.html. You can find announcements on upcoming ACM and SIGSOFT webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and www.sigsoft.org. On behalf of SIGSOFT, the speaker, and myself, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you'll join us again in the future. This concludes today's webinar.